I call Caroline Lucas participating virtually. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and apologies for the technical hitch. It's been almost two years since this House declared a climate and nature emergency, and it's been over one year since Parliament last debated the climate nature crisis as an interlinked issue. Yet the need not just for debate and declarations, but for ambitious action could not be more urgent. The world is now hotter than at any time in the last 12,000 years, and 16 of the 17 hottest years on record have taken place since 2000. Record fires have raged in the Amazon and the US. Ice caps in Greenland melt at a terrifying pace, and Storm Etta wreaked havoc and unimaginable tragedy in Central America. At the same time, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has set out the grim facts on nature and biodiversity. One million species now threatened with extinction, many within decades, more than ever before in human history. Every warning light on the dashboard is flashing red. And with the UK due to host the Climate Summit, COP26 in November, and with the COP15 Biodiversity Summit also taking place this year, the responsibility to show honest and bold global leadership could not be greater. And that means acknowledging three things. First, that our domestic climate policy is inconsistent and incoherent. To take just one example, the government's failure to call in the recent decision to allow a new coal mine in Cumbria has prompted James Hansen, for 10 years NASA's most senior climate scientist, to warn that the prime minister risks humiliation by showing such contemptuous disregard of the future of young people and nature. The UK cannot lead a good COP from a position of weakness and inconsistency. And second, we're off course to meet both our fourth and fifth carbon budgets. Not only that, but those budgets are based on an 80% emission reduction by 2050, not net zero. And the latest annual progress report from the Climate Change Committee highlighted that the government has failed on 17 of its 21 progress indicators, and that just two out of 31 key policy milestones have been met. And thirdly, and most crucially for tonight's debate, the science on which the net zero by 2050 target and thus the revised Climate Change Act are based has moved on. It's time to update the legislation. Let me explain why. The climate doesn't care about target dates. What matters is how much carbon is emitted into the atmosphere over the rest of this century. The IPCC has estimated that a global carbon budget the total burnable carbon between 2018 and 2100, consistent with a 66% chance of 1.5 degrees warming, is just 420 billion tonnes of CO2. Now it's currently being burned at approximately 40 billion tonnes a year. On current trends, that gives us until 2030 at the latest, before that global carbon budget is used up. After that point, we would have to rely on costly and uncertain negative emission technologies to avoid global heating of more than 1.5 degrees. Historically, the UK has been one of the world's biggest emitters. We started the modern fossil fuel age with the industrial revolution. We're disproportionately responsible for the cumulative emissions in the atmosphere. So if you factor that in alongside the need to allow space for poorer countries to develop, a fair carbon budget for the UK looks like around two and a half billion tonnes of CO2 over that same period. If we calculate emissions on a consumption basis, that is if we take responsibility for carbon burned overseas in the service of UK consumption, we are burning through our fair carbon budget at more than 500 million tonnes a year. Madam Deputy Speaker, that gives us just five years before it's gone. That is the reality, that is the inconvenient truth. And that's why we urgently need to adopt the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill a private member's bill that I introduced into the House last year, which has the support so far of 98 MPs from eight different parties. The 2008 Climate Act was undoubtedly pioneering in its time, and many other countries have taken inspiration from it, but it is now hopelessly out of date. An emergency means we need to act now in line with what the science demands. And the beauty of the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill, or C-Bill, is that it offers government, parliament and citizens a framework for the UK to play the fairest and most effective role it can to meet the crisis head on. A framework designed for coherence and integrity. 
the Seabill follows the science. It represents the last best chance for this house to tackle the climate and ecological crisis we all face together. It's been drafted with the help of expert scientists and has three primary goals. To ensure the UK meets targets designed to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees, the point we must not pass if we're to avoid catastrophe. To conserve and restore nature, ensuring that we protect this life-sustaining planet that is our common home. And to give people a real say in how we transition to a zero carbon society, drawing on the creativity and the ingenuity of the British people as we recover from the effects of the pandemic. It also seeks to fill in the holes of the Climate Change Act in three key ways. First, by accounting for the UK's emissions on a consumption basis, counting the emissions we're responsible for overseas, as well as the emissions from international aviation and shipping. Second, by setting out measures which tackle the climate and ecological emergencies simultaneously. And third, by involving citizens in what will need to be an equitable shift towards a fairer and greener society. Madam Deputy Speaker, we need to tell the truth about our climate emissions. The government likes to say that it's reduced emissions by over 40% since 1990, but that's only true on a territorial basis. And one of the ways it's been achieved is by offshoring so much of our manufacturing and essentially outsourcing so many of those emissions to countries like China. So if you factor those back in, we've reduced emissions by much less than 40% and possibly by as little as 10 or 15%. It is time for honesty, time to face reality. The Climate Change Committee has now published its advice in relation to the sixth carbon budget for the year 2035 and specifically recommended that international aviation and shipping emissions be taken into account. I would welcome confirmation from the minister tonight that the government intends to heed that advice. I'd also note that the CCC's advice still leaves out the emissions associated with trade. So I'd like to ask the minister, will the UK commit to updating its consumption-based accounts and setting targets and budgets which take account of all the carbon emissions attributable to UK consumption, including those associated with imports? And does she agree that COP26 is the golden opportunity for the international community to start to coordinate action on consumption-based emissions with a view to ensuring consistent, robust methods of calculation, avoiding the risk of double counting, and to get the incentives right for different actors. Now, one of the most important policies in the Sea Bill is the inclusion of nature. Nature has been absent from these debates for far too long. And the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, failing right now to meet 17 out of 20 UN biodiversity targets. Yet climate and nature are two faces of the same problem. The Sea Bill places a premium on nature-based solutions, making change now, rather than relying on speculative future technologies. And unless we change the goals of our economic system, away from ever increasing growth as the Dasgupta review demonstrates, we will undermine both our own health and that of the natural world. As Professor Dasgupta says, we need to change how we think, act and measure economic success to protect and enhance our prosperity and the natural world. And if anyone is in any doubt about that, consider that the global economy is set to nearly triple in size between now and 2050, which means three times more production and consumption. It is hard enough to decarbonize the current economy in such a short time span. The idea that we will be able to do it three times over whilst protecting and restoring nature is, frankly, for the birds. Or quite literally not. Not for the birds, not for the bees, not for the thousands of species at risk from the impact of human activity on the planet. The UN Biodiversity Summit COP15 due to take place in May is an immediate opportunity for the government to raise the bar and demonstrate that it is listening to Das Gupta and others. And then finally, citizens engagement. It's important to recall that the 2008 Climate Change Act itself also started life as a presentation bill in 2005, inspired by civil society's Big Ask campaign. It's proof that by working together with shared purpose giving a voice to thousands of concerned citizens calling for change, global history can be made. Likewise, the Sea Bill is the People's Bill. It sprung from the grassroots with the intention of giving the public a real say on the climate and nature emergency. The brainchild of the Sea Bill Alliance, a talented group of campaigners, including those who previously fought for the Climate Change Act, it's also had input from scientists at the cutting edge of climate and ecology. 
And my thanks goes to them all and to all those who've joined the campaign. Because the campaign for the Sea Bill is broad and inclusive, working with allies from business, trade unions, faith groups, charities, local communities, the arts and individuals. And the bill has participative democracy at its heart. The transition to a zero carbon future isn't something that should be done to people. It's something which should be done with people. Only then will it be a just transition. And there's an opportunity too for the process to give citizens fresh agency and hope for our response to the climate crisis to renew our tired and failing democracy. Initiatives such as the Climate Assembly UK shows there is huge appetite to be part of identifying and agreeing positive solutions. Assembly members came up with ambitious ideas like free bus travel, a frequent flyer levy, advertising bans on high emission products. You know, we're often told that the public won't get on board with bold policies, but that couldn't be further from the truth. And it's also striking that alongside clear, proactive, accountable and consistent leadership from the government, Assembly members also wanted cross-party consensus and for political parties to work together. The CBIL proposes a new and much larger emergency assembly to guide parliament and government in its strategy to reduce emissions and restore nature, to help ministers, not hinder them, and ensure that action reflects the boldness for which citizens are crying out. So can the minister outline tonight whether the government does have plans to actively and meaningfully engage the people of this country in tackling the climate and nature crises? And what role does she envisage would be played by participative democracy? To conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are nearing a cliff edge of cascading earth system collapse. The narrow window for limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is closing fast. Leadership means telling the truth about what that means for people's lives and livelihoods. It is no exaggeration to say that this is the most consequential decade in human history. The experience of COVID-19 has demonstrated that with a collective understanding of the nature of a crisis, governments can take radical, unprecedented action. The scale and ramifications of the emergency requires us to set aside party differences as happened in 2008 and reach for the new vision of human prosperity that we know is possible. With sufficient political will, we can cooperate to ensure that we all thrive within the limits of our planet. But it isn't going to happen without new legislation that gives us a framework commensurate with the science and with the reality. And the CBIL is that new legislation. It brings the future into the present and our responsibility to the future into the present too. So I hope the minister will grasp this opportunity to recognize that the climate crisis is bigger than any one political ideology and work with me and others on legislation which could be a new and desperately needed global first. Uh, vi video link, Nadia Whittam. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a real privilege to follow on from the Honourable Member for Brighton Pavilion, and I'm very proud to co-sponsor her Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. Madam Deputy Speaker, the emergence of coronavirus has thrown into focus the way that environmental degradation can have profound impacts on society. And of course, the escalating ecological crisis will make future pandemics more likely. So we must make sure that our recovery is a green one right from the start, and we cannot wait until the pandemic is over to take these urgent steps. We cannot afford to lose sight of the climate crisis because it threatens our very existence. The 2018 special report by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded that to stop runaway climate chaos, we need, and I quote, rapid and far reaching transitions that are unprecedented in terms of scale. Yet we've heard from my honourable friend what little progress we have made on that. This bill really offers the most viable way for us to tackle the climate and nature emergency at a national level. It provides a clear framework to deliver the UK's commitments to um, the Paris Climate Agreements. For example, the bill would introduce measures to dramatically reduce our emissions, restore and regenerate our soils, biodiverse habitats and ecosystems, and also to lessen the negative impacts that we have on our environment. 
in short, it would mean that the government would have to take immediate and radical action of the sort that this crisis demands. The bill's been written by scientists, lawyers and climate activists. It's backed by a broad range of campaign groups, businesses, charities and individuals. And as will be evidenced today, it has huge cross-party support. In May 2019, this House declared a climate and ecological emergency, but that means very little without comprehensive legislation. We cannot simply declare, Madam Deputy Speaker, we must also act. And this bill is essential to fulfilling that commitment that we made almost two years ago. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm grateful for the opportunity to show solidarity with the Honourable Member for Brighton Pavilion, um, not least by taking the perch that she's quite accustomed to on these benches. But this is an important opportunity to demonstrate the cross-party and cross-border ambition that exists to tackle the climate emergency. The Scottish Government and First Minister were the first on these islands to declare a climate emergency. I'm still not sure if the UK Government itself has declared an emergency in the way that the House as a whole has. Um, but there is undoubtedly cross-party agreement on the need uh, to raise our level of ambition and the level of action that we're taking. The Scottish Parliament has already passed a second uh, Climate Change Act with genuinely world-beating carbon emission reductions, take, uh, uh, carbon emission reductions targets. Um, and of course, we have the opportunity to go further and faster as technology and political will allows us to do. We're also committed in Scotland to a just transition, transforming local economies, and we've already committed to higher environmental standards and nature standards. For example, on air pollution, the kind of amendments that the Tory government was busy rejecting in last week's environment uh, bill. So we do wish the Honourable Member for Brighton Pavilion well with her bill. I think it's disappointing that the procedures uh, in this place aren't allowing it to have the proper debate that it deserves, but she has given an indication of how popular campaigning and determination can make these things work. So perhaps beyond the Queen's speech, we'll see further opportunity for proper debates and votes on the proposals and to test the will of the House on them. But in Glasgow, my city, we do look forward to hosting COP26 later this year. I hope one day soon Scotland will be able to become an independent signatory uh, to the Paris Agreement and whatever protocol arrives from Glasgow. But in the meantime, the UK government has to lead by example. Talk is not enough, and we're demonstrating tonight that the cross-party ambition and the political will is there if the government is willing to take that action. Video link, Sarah Olney. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening to provide support to the member for Brighton Pavilion in this very important debate. Uh, and I'm here to speak on behalf of all Liberal Democrats when we say that we really, really support the continued progress of this bill. Um, while we've been uh, discussing climate and a ecological emergency, for me, one of the real priorities is that this bill brings together both the action needed on climate change and the action needed on the environment. Both of these are absolutely critical, as the member for Bright Brighton Pavilion laid out so excellently in her opening speech. But I think what is really, really clear is that the current structure of government is not well set up to deliver on both of uh, our objectives, uh, and the government's objectives in these areas. We see too much stovepiping between different departments on both climate and in the environment. And to bring it all together, to, to set this as one clear objective or one set of objectives that can be driven forward together, uh, I think is really, really important and I think is the real strength of this bill. I've been involved in a number of um, events up and down the country uh, digitally uh, to uh, support this bill and to talk more to, uh, to the public about it. And one of the things that's really become clear is that what we can really use the platform this bill provides to do is to speak to public much more openly about climate, about the ecological emergency, because we all know that there will be a measure of uh, individual behaviour change required. And it is really urgent that we start talking to members of the public right now about what they need to do in order to deliver the real change we need to see if we are to combat climate change and make a real difference to our environment. So those are the reasons why I'm personally supporting this bill, as I said, um, speaking on behalf of all Liberal Democrats, and we really, really want to see 
this progress through uh, the Commons, and I echo what the uh, member before me said about uh, the structures of the House not allowing this. But I really do believe that if a, a way could be found for more members to be able to have their say on the elements of this bill, we would see a lot more progress. Thank you very much. Before I bring in the next speaker, I think it's quite important to say that adjournment debates should not be about specific pieces of legislation. The title of the debate is about the UK's response to the climate and ecological emergency, and references to a bill are fine, but it is not a forum for discussion of a particular bill. I'm sure that Liz Savile-Roberts will take that into account in her speech. Liz Savile-Roberts. And it is an honour for me to, in the cross party spirit, to work today with the member for Brighton Pavilion. Um, I thought what we we're all trying to do, of course, is raise the sense of urgency and by the best means we can and use this house and this chamber to good effect. Of course, climate change and ecosystem degradation are already a pressing reality in Wales and changing weather patterns to biodiversity loss. With the 2019 report concluding that 666 species are threatened with extinction and 73 have been lost already. It's clear to address this issue effectively and quickly, we need to mobilise unprecedented levels of innovation and investment across our economy and society. Wales is a nation committed to transition, with the principle of sustainable development written into our constitution. But to bring about real transition, the UK also has to change. This means devolving and centralising power rather than centralising decision-making and resources necessary for that. Critically, this means increased economic and borrowing powers for the Government of Wales to finance the pivotal transition with the rapidity our climate and environment demands. I therefore welcome today's debate, and I hope the UK Government will consider how best to support this transition across all four nations of the UK, particularly in the upcoming budget. Colleagues, and to close, no nation in the world can manage climate change alone, but neither can centralised command and control alone bring about the change we need. Uh, thank you. Before I call the Minister, I should say there have been a number of contributions, and I do think it needs to be noted that this has left the Minister with a very short amount of time to respond. She only has six minutes. Uh, Minister Anne Trevelyan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to congratulate my honourable friend um, for Brighton Pavilion for this adjournment debate. It's such an important subject, and I'm really pleased that I was able to share some of my time with colleagues because this absolutely uh, is an issue that uh, speaks far more widely uh, than uh, even this Parliament. This is an international global challenge. So how we act on climate change, I think, is the most pressing issue of our time. I completely agree with her. Um, so whilst we presently find ourselves in the midst of this very, very difficult pandemic, which of course is our short-term priority, we must not and have not abandoned our planet's need for urgent care because we risk so many further crises for our children. Climate change is happening now, and this government is determined that the UK will be a world leader in ensuring the Paris Agreement takes root across the globe. We will demonstrate that through our own commitment to bring down our country's greenhouse gas emissions, as well as acting this year with the presidency of COP, we will be a global leader. The Prime Minister's commitment to doubling our international climate finance to 11.6 billion and 3 billion of that to those nature-based solutions, I think, is a critical commitment that we have made. We were the first major economy in the world to set a legally binding target to reach net zero carbon emissions across our economy by 2050. And we have shown that rapid progress on decarbonisation is possible alongside a thriving economy. Our, our emissions are down by almost 44% across the last 30 years, and our economy has grown by 78% in the same period. And we have been absolute in our commitment to power past coal over the last 10 years, with a reduction in electricity generation from coal from 40% in 2012 to less than 5% today, replaced by renewables. So we have made significant progress in meeting our climate targets, meeting our first two carbon budgets and projected to meet the third out of 2022. We exceeded the required emissions reduction of the first by 1.2% and the second by nearly 14%. But now is the time to double down, Madam Deputy Speaker, and decrease our emissions further and faster. So to do this, the Prime Minister set out his 10-point plan last year to lead the world into a new green industrial revolution. 
We set out ambitious policies backed by £12 billion of government investment. The plan will support up to 250,000 highly skilled green jobs across the UK and accelerate our path to reaching net zero by 2050, whilst laying the foundations for building back greener. So the Tendoy plan will develop the cutting-edge technologies needed to drive down those emissions in industries across the UK through significant investment into hydrogen, new nuclear and carbon capture technologies. But the 10-point plan will go further. We're backing our world-leading automotive sector, including in the West Midlands, the North East and Wales, with a £2.8 billion package to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles and transform our national infrastructure to better support that electric vehicle revolution. Working with industry will drive the growth of low-carbon hydrogen. As part of the 10-point plan, we're aiming for 5 gigawatt of low-carbon hydrogen by 2030. This see the UK benefit from around 8,000 jobs across our industrial heartlands and beyond. Um, importantly for me, we're determined this transition must be a just and fair one. The Treasury is conducting a review into the cost of net zero. In its review, due to be published this spring, it will outline how the transition to a net zero economy will be funded and ensure contributions are fair between households, businesses and the taxpayer. So we must ensure that the net zero transition works for everyone. Throughout the UK, more than 2.5 million highly skilled people employed in manufacturing who make a huge contribution to the wealth and character of their communities. We must not take these skills away from people. So as industry changes, our lifetime skills guarantee will ensure that people are equipped with the skills they need to adapt to the new products and services we want them to provide. So we've also launched the Green Jobs Task Force, bringing businesses and unions together with skills providers and governments to develop plans for new long-term good quality green jobs by 2030. This year we find ourselves in the privileged position of being both President of the G7 and host and President of COP26. And we are determined to use these key international events to promote ambitious action to deliver the transformational change required by the Paris Agreement. I have the extraordinary honour of being not only the Minister for Energy, but also the international champion for COP26 for adaptation and resilience. Uh, And that is one of the critical challenges we have as a global leader, is to make sure not only that we walk the walk in demonstrating our decarbonisation in the UK, taking our country to a place where our greenhouse gas emissions are no longer impacting on the planet, but also helping those developing countries who need to be able to grow and support their communities to do so in a green way, building back better after the traumas that COVID has caused to so many of those very poorest developing countries. So we are going to bring forward our own bold proposals, including our net zero strategy in the run-up to COP26, to demonstrate that we will be cutting those emissions and creating new jobs and bolstering those new industries across our country to lead on that global stage and make sure that the UK's voice and our commitment to net zero and ensuring that we protect our planet for our children and theirs ahead is something that we can deliver. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the, quest- uh, the question is that this House do now adjourn. As many as of that opinion say, aye, aye, aye. the ayes have it.